let's see, so if you've been reading some of these books that have been published lately, there seems to be an increasing tension that machines are going to take over the world and leave us humans without a job. In fact, Bill Gates and Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawking have all come out to say that they think that artificial intelligence poses an existential threat to us humans. Well, this is not gonna be such a talk. It's not about the tensions between machines and humans. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's about combining their unique talents to produce new capabilities. So let's start with uh, a very familiar machine learning task, that of the recommender system. So here's a screenshot from Amazon where it's recommending products to me, probably using a collaborative filtering algorithm on the top and maybe an affinities algorithm on the bottom. So we as consumers have become used to this, right? We, we've embraced this. We use this for uh, navigation and discovery when shopping online. But what we, when we go into stores, we have a very different experience. We talk to a real human, and she will listen to our needs and help us find things. There's many that will argue that this on the left, which is powered by machines, is the digital version of that, which is powered by a knowledgeable human. Well, this talk is to suggest that these are not alternatives for one another, that you can't even compare whether one is better than the other. They just have very different capabilities. So allow me to illustrate those different capabilities. Scanning the room, you mostly appear human. So I'm gonna ask you to perform two tasks. So when you, uh, we'll go task one first, and when you know the answer, just put your hand up really high so I can see it. Okay, task number one. Find the eigenvectors in that matrix. <laughs> just put your hand up really high so I can see it. We do have somebody about it, and usually there is one smart ass that thinks they can. Um, now, you can all do it, actually. If you remember from undergraduate math, how to find eigenvectors, it's a lot of rote calculations. And you can all do it, it's just gonna take you a long time, and you're probably gonna make some mistakes along the way. All right, that was a tough one. Let's do the second task, and I think this will be better suited for your talents. So put your hand up when you see it. Find the leopard print dress. All right, we have hands, great. And you weren't fooled the fact that it was blue and you weren't tricked by the leopard print dog. So, but machines are gonna struggle with this, right? This is hard for a machine to do. Um, they're not gonna take a lot of time to render their judgment, but they're gonna be inconsistent with their accuracy, right? Unless they had blue leopard skin dresses in their training set or dogs and chairs, right? Those are new to them and they're probably gonna get that wrong. It's gonna be a bit of a struggle. So there should be little difference, that, little doubt that these two remarkable processors, each of these machines and humors are processors, but they have very different capabilities. So if I had a task that had to do with a lot of rote calculations, say finding eigenvectors, I would route that to a machine. But if I had a task that needed some improvising or um, knowledge of social norms or relating to other humans, then I might go with a different type of processor. I might go with a human processor. Did that go? Oh, there we go. So finding dresses, things like that. Us humans are much better at that. So this idea of programmatic access to human brains is not terribly new, right? So back in the 1940s, if you were to say the word computer, it was assumed that you meant this type of fleshy processor. Right? These were people whose job it was to add up long strings of number. Right? You'd hand them a piece of paper, they'd summarize it, and they hand it back. So a very asynchronous way of using a compute resource. Now, we, today we use human computation, but in two very different ways. First, we do not ask them to do rote calculations anymore. The machines are far more effective at that. Rather, we ask humans to perform tasks that only humans can do. And second, with connected devices, we truly do have programmatic access to their brains, right? There's, uh, we don't have to gather them in a room like that, and nor do they have to work on any set hours. They can take tasks whenever they want. So with programmatic access to these two compute resources, you can do some amazing things. And it turns out there are some problems that call for precisely their combination. So I happen to work for one such company. It's called Stitch Fix. Has anybody heard of Stitch Fix? Some of the women, we do men's clothes now too. Um, so Stitch Fix is, it's apparel, it's e-commerce, and you can buy clothes from us. 
but there's no shopping at Stitch Fix. Nowhere on the site or in the app are you gonna find a browse page or a product page or a search box. You're not even gonna get recommendations here on the site. At Stitch Fix, the customer does not pick out the clothes. And this is the value proposition. There's a lot of people that hate shopping, they don't have time, or they don't know what's cool currently in style or what might be appropriate for their age. They want help with this. They want a service to do that for them. So this is how the service works. If you were a customer, you would first have to fill out a pretty lengthy style profile. It's a one-time task, like 60 questions. You have to tell us everything about yourself, your height, your age, your weight, your preferences for fit, your preferences for um, size. You can even write a free-form note that contains elements of your lifestyle that might be pertinent. You can also make a Pinterest pin board of things that you found on the internet and you like and you want to share them with us. Anything that's relevant to helping us pick out clothes for you. So once you have your style profile in, the next thing that's going to happen is an algorithm that is going to run and leverage all of that information and it's going to pick five things for you. From there, we are going to ship it to you, sight unseen. We're not going to show you a preview or anything like that. We ship it, we commit to this, and we give it right to your door. The first time you see it is when you open the box at your own home. You could try the clothes on. You can experience them in the privacy of your own home with your own shoes and wardrobe. You can get feedback from a loved one. And you only pay for what you tell us you love and you're going to keep. You can send the rest back. You can send it all back. We pay the shipping both ways. So that's how it works. It's a recommendation engine, but with a much greater commitment because we're gonna actually do the physical delivery to your door. So there's a lot of companies that use recommender systems. Some use it for incremental sales. Others use it as a means of engagement. And others use it as their primary vehicle for discovery. But at Stitch Fix, it's everything for us. 100% of what we sell goes through our recommendation engine. Um, in addition, we have some pretty severe penalties when we get things wrong. We've all had a goofy recommendation on Amazon before you buy something for your niece or nephew, you're forever plagued with kid toys, right? We shrug our shoulders, we move on. But for us, this is not uh, a trivial matter. We've got the cost of shipping both ways. We've got the cost of that inventory being out, and we've got a very pissed off customer. She's not shrugging her shoulders at this. She may have been counting on these clothes for some event that she was going to, right? So she's not gonna be thrilled about this. So we've got to get this right. We've got to leverage every bit of processing we can get our hands on, the machine type and the human type. So here's how it works. Over there, we have our machine compute resources. And in the middle, we got our human compute resources, and we have our logistics function that provides some other benefits. Now, we run in Amazon's cloud, and that provides us virtually limitless access to machines. We have all the machines we need. For humans, we have amassed an army of over 2,500 human stylists, right? These are people skilled in fashion, and they're ready to help with their wardrobe. So they're not gonna be taking lay tasks. These are not mechanical Turk type of people. These are experts. And together, they compose the algorithm, right? So we're gonna be routing tasks between them. Now, to coordinate their work, we use a queuing mechanism. Um, machines have a very different work style than humans, right? Machines, uh, they work very quickly. They're nearly infatigable. While humans work more slowly, they need breaks, they need to sleep, they need to eat. So we use a queuing mechanism to coordinate their work. So here's how it works from a customer standpoint. That's a customer. So if she wants to receive a shipment of clothes, she would have to just pick a date. Once she has that style profile done, she just picks a date. When does she want to receive them? And that creates this shipment request, which needs to go into one of those queues. We have many queues because we have multiple distribution centers, and there may be one that's particularly better suited for her. So we have a machine-only algorithm that picks which is the most appropriate queue for her. And once selected, it gets in there. And now the first thing we're going to do is route the shipment over to the machines. And this is where we're gonna do everything that benefits from rote calculations. We're gonna do all kinds of things. We're gonna run what we call the M algorithm, M for machines. And that's gonna do things like PCA and SVD to find the directions in the data that explain the most variance. We'll do things like matrix factorization that leverages latent attributes that might explain what somebody's gonna like. And we got mixed effects models that captures interactions between the customer and the products. And we got neural networks and deep learning for all the image and text data. These things might require literally billions of calculation, and these are far better done by machines. 
effectively what they're doing is they're taking all the inventory that we could send her and they're putting it in the context of her, her preferences. And they're eliminating a lot of the inventory from Canada to see and they're gonna take what's left and rank order it in the probability that she's gonna love this stuff. So that's the rank ordered list and it's gonna return that back to the queue. Now we're not gonna stop there. Remember how important this is to our business model. We're gonna have to leverage all the processing. That means humans too, expert humans. So the next step is we're gonna route that information over to one of our humans. And we don't just pick arbitrarily. Humans are far more heterogeneous than their machine counterparts. We wanna pick the right one. We wanna pick the one that is gonna have the highest chance of success with our customer. So it picks one and gets routed over to her. And then she's gonna perform the H algorithm, H for human. And this is where we do all the tasks that only a human can do. Things like use cognition, improvise, and uh, they'll do the curation and apply their knowledge of social norms and they're gonna foster a relationship. Ultimately, they're gonna narrow it down to five, the exact five things that are gonna be put in the box. So we got it down to five. She puts it back to the queue and that sends a signal over to our logistics department and they're gonna turn that information into physical product. They're gonna do the pick, pack, and ship. We do our own warehousing and all that stuff so we can control the experience. They wrap it up beautifully, the experience matters. They put it in the box with nice tissue paper and they get it over to her. So it's about more, it's about not only machines, not only humans, and providing some other benefits and all that stuff adds up to make her very happy. So the assertion here, S, the function S here is our styling uh, function, and a styling function that is composed of human and machine resources is going to do better than one composed of either one alone. For that to be true, we need to have them have additive results, right? We want these things additive plus some interactions or synergy between them. All right, for this to happen, we have two conditions that must be met. Both machines and humans have to have non-zero contributions and they must be doing different contributions. They can't be doing the same things. So that makes training interesting. So training machines is fairly straightforward. There's a lot of literature out there. We can do things like um, cross-fold validation and back propagation and uh, feature selection and regularization. There's a lot of existing techniques that we leverage and this is, we use them all to train our machines. But training humans is a little different. There exists that H algorithm and it runs up here on human hardware. And it's learned over a lifetime of experiences and observations. And it's hidden to us, right? But we can reveal it. We can reveal it by subtly varying the information we show our humans in this custom UI we built. And we can figure out what pieces of information help them with decisions and which pieces don't. And that way we can ensure that they only make positive contributions and that they're complementary to that of the machines. In addition to those additive results that we get, there's other benefits you get by combining humans and machines in the same system. You get scale, you get feedback between them, they help each other get better. You get something called control variation, it's like an exploration, exploitation strategy. But the one that I like the best is this notion of specialization. Because we don't ask our humans to do rote calculations, that enables them to be more human. Our customers write in notes like this. This one says, my husband is returning home from a tour in Iraq. He is disabled. I would love something to wear for a very special date night. Now our stylists are very much real humans and they can't help but be moved by this. And sometimes they do more than provide their styling services. They empathize with the customer, they write back. They sometimes send flowers or they might thank their the customer for her husband's service. They move people in a very special way. So in essence, our machines are enabling more human humans. That's all I got, thank you. Thank you very much, this was great. And by the way, you have the coolest um, title ever, right? Your Chief Algorithms Officer? Chief Algorithms Officer, yes. Is there, is there anybody else that has a title? Uh, there's been a few, there's been one at Amazon years ago. Is that right? Booty member, but uh, it's That's still awesome. niche. So just one question from, from me and then, the, um, so do we have mics somewhere? Do, do we have somebody carrying mics? Okay, we have one here. Okay, so, sorry. 
So just one question from me. Um, tell us a little bit about the uh, sort of the tools that you guys use, the infrastructure, that type of thing. I, what, what's the sort of the, the tools of the trade? So we, we have mostly been uh, creating I, our own infrastructure, right? So we're mostly Python based. We use the usual tools, um, S3 and Spark. Um, we have a, one of the largest uh, data science teams in Silicon Valley. We have 65 PhDs working on this. Um, not this, this problem, but lots of algorithms throughout the company. The company is very data driven. We have much richer data than your average company, right? Um, 65 PhD? 65, yeah, and growing. We need more. Um, but yeah, so it's been uh, uh, quite a, a run in terms of the innovations and the technology that people have come out, everything from natural language processing to teaching um, machines, using computer vision, teaching them about style and uh, teaching them to, uh, you know, pull out elements of style from images, right? Like, uh, what does it mean when the zipper's sideways? It means it's a more edgy blouse, right? All these types of things. So it's been a great um, time and just fascinating. You're always, you're always uh, super excited to wake up and go to work in the morning. It's actually, uh, so any question? It's actually, while well, well, they get the mic, it's actually kind of fascinating, very much to the point about the, I guess, the opportunity, but also the limitation of working uh, with machines, like human and machines, the fact that you have 65 PhDs and that you still have people do tons of, sort of human stuff. Um, oh, yeah. It really gives a, I mean, drives home the point uh, around the, the, the fact that we're not completely there with the machines. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, we make no attempt to get the machines to act like humans, and nor so the other way around, right? We want them to be, to leverage their unique strengths. Um, and so it's been great in that regard that uh, we have these wonderful complementary compute resources that we leverage them both. So, oh, sorry. No. Hi. Sorry, so I was wondering, I noticed that the human-machine interaction goes through one input from the machine to the human and then another one back from the human to the machine. I was wondering if you thought that like richer feedback loops between human and machine are the kind of thing that could lead to better results or if you just don't get much mileage out of that? Uh, absolutely. Um, I didn't show it in these slides, but there is a rich feedback loop between human and machines. So we have logged the hell out of their interface that they use, right? So every gesture they make, every interaction is recorded and it's all feedback back to the machines on making them better and likewise we uh, can give the humans lots of feedback on the outcomes of their decisions, complete with p-values and confidence intervals that ensure they get better and better, and also expose biases if they have them, right? So yes, there's a rich interaction between the two. Hi, uh, mine is a two-part question. The first one is uh, like easy ball for you to uh, put your marketing pitch, is what is the uh, strike the uh, success rate for your selections and secondly like do you also take into account like other things which these people are searching for on different sites to provide like a better um, data set for selections well let's see the, the first question I can't answer anyway so I, we, won't, we won't go there uh, it was how many things do people keep um, I can't tell you the actual answer it's too proprietary uh, your second question was do we take into account what people search for um, they tell us more explicitly they, they tell us um, if you can't express it in words they pin things to Pinterest and they know that we're gonna see them they make a specific Pinterest boards um, and they write us notes they do anything they can to help us help them right they have every incentive in the world for us to be great at this. Um, and it's a great, uh, you know, I came before this from Netflix, and at Netflix it was like pulling teeth to get the customer to tell you anything about themselves, right? You had to rely completely on implicit data. Um, because at Netflix you can pick out your own TVs, TV shows and movies, right? But at Stitch Fix you can't pick out the clothes. That's our job, we, we'll do that for you. And so that creates this very nice copacetic relationship between the two, that we only have their best interest in mind and they only have ours, they want to help us and give us more information so that we can get better. Time for one last quickish one. Have you done any sort of analysis as the type of person that would allow you to take those liberties? Which type of liberties? Uh, allowing somebody to, the customer, telling the customer what she or, or do you do this for men or only for women? what she or he really wants. I think the question is around what, who's our audience? Uh, is who, would, who is willing to accept this? 
Oh, to give that information in exchange? Well, no, to allow somebody else to make these decisions oh, for I them. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, anybody who doesn't like to shop or, or anybody who doesn't want to go acquire the knowledge on their own of what is currently in style. It's a lot of unpaid work, and I, I'm so happy that we're doing men's now because I can't stand going to a mall. First, there's the time, but also I have no idea what I'm doing out there. I don't know what I'm looking for. I need somebody to tell me. Have you done any sort of psychological or demographic profile of these people? It's all walks of life. It would not, we, we do not have a single segment that we can claim is uh, representative of our customer. There's not even a 1% um, segment of our largest. We tried cutting them in every way. There's no rhyme or reason. It's everybody. I mean, well, women only, now men. We're just growing our men customer base now. All right, very cool. Thank you very much, Eric. Appreciate Thanks for having me.